In today's episode, we're going to talk about a colony we haven't discussed much. We'll go a little bit into its history, but ultimately, we're bringing Maine into our story just long enough to kill it off. You're listening to Rejects and Revolutionaries with Sarah Tinsalpola, a podcast tracing the origins of America from the Tudor era to the 20th century. The vast majority of our admittedly limited main discussion has involved disputes with and among the French Acadians. But as we've noted, England had a distinct presence in the area, led by Ferdinando Gorges. This presence was small, though, isolated, individualistic, and ultimately fairly inconsequential. But the colony's 1652 takeover by the Massachusetts Bay Colony is a vital part of the story of America, which would have repercussions even after the War of Independence. So it's time to take an episode to look at exactly what Maine was, what it became, and how that happened. Gorges was, by the start of the English Civil War, 76 years old. He'd grown up during the reign of Elizabeth I, fought the Armada, and come to prominence thanks to his close friendship with the doomed Earl of Essex. Though he advised Essex against his rebellion, and even testified against him at his trial, Gorges was then imprisoned until James I took the English throne. After his release, his Elizabethan ambitions had turned toward the New World, and he had become one of the most passionate advocates of North American colonization. His focus was honed when John Smith returned from America with tales of the wondrous beauty and potential of the area that he called New England. The company Gorgeous had founded had been the one to ultimately grant Plymouth and Massachusetts Bay their land, as well as a fair number of other potential colonies. Most of these had failed, though, and their patents had gone unused long enough to be invalidated. At the same time, Gorges also tried setting up his own colonies. He had started with the Popham Colony in 1607, the same year as Jamestown was founded, but that had failed. In the 1620s, he'd started trying again, and the result of his efforts was the 1639 foundation of the province of Maine. Maine was an ambitious project. Gorges' vision was a colony as prosperous as Massachusetts, as feudal as Maryland, and as Anglican as Virginia. Between foreign wars and domestic politicking, he had never actually been able to fulfill his dreams of visiting the New World himself, but he had poured over the maps and planned a series of settlements which would come together to realize such a dream. And in 1642, he founded its capital, Gorgiana. If you've been listening to the podcast up to this point, you should be able to predict some of the problems here. Colonization was hard, and grand visions didn't work. Gorges was only one person, and colonization was resource-intensive enough that it was an intense financial strain for even the richest person. And Gorges was wealthy, but nowhere near being the richest. And of course, there was the political situation in England. It's not really the best timing to start a colony, three years before a devastating war all but stops voluntary emigration. And to be on the losing side of that war was even worse. As you, who are now so intimately familiar with the era of the English Civil War, no doubt already put together from the fact that he was an Anglican and hierarchy-minded person, Ferdinando Gorges was an impassioned royalist. In fact, He would later offer to lead cavalry troops into battle during the war, but this offer would be rejected because he was almost 80 years old at the time. He would, however, help to plan the battle, 
which returned Bristol to royalist control. So Maine started out on shaky footing, like all colonies. Instead of his dream, Gorges's colony had the poverty and rural character of Virginia, the lack of commercial farming of Massachusetts Bay, and the non-quit-rent paying refugees from other colonies that Maryland had. It was a wilderness with no social cohesion, where people could do just enough trading, trapping, and fishing to get by, and maybe buy and grow enough food to live independently for a while. It was, more than anything, like Newfoundland, and this was a hard life, but it did come with benefits. If you didn't want to be constrained by a society, it was actually a place that you could go to escape it. If you didn't fit in in New England, Maine was probably where you would go. Likewise, if you were pushed off your land by the Massachusetts Bay Company, like quite a few people were, you would most likely end up in Maine. And meanwhile, Gorges, like so many earlier proprietors, was totally unable to make money from his plans. He presided over a non-functional economy and government, and even if those were up and running, a huge portion of his settlers, especially those New England exiles, were essentially squatters. They lived there without permission and made money on the land that he was pouring money into without giving anything back. And Gorges did pour money into Maine. All of his money, in fact. He would ultimately die penniless. Plus, the French of French Acadia claimed some land which England felt should have been Gorges's, And this, of course, is where the Latour and Dalnay fights took place. So, it was a mess of the type that we have often discussed before. And a lot of its early stories also sound somewhat familiar. For instance, we have Thomas Gorges, Ferdinando's 22-year-old cousin who was sent to be Maine's governor. Like so many aspiring leaders who have entered our story, Thomas was a respectable person who showed huge promise, but who was quickly overwhelmed by New World realities and burned out on the frustrations of governing with no stable society and no support from England. He came to Maine, like I said, at 22 years old, a devout Presbyterian who had hoped to work with Massachusetts Bay to the benefit of both, while remaining loyal to his aging proprietor. And Winthrop actually liked him, and so did the local Indians, with whom he soon forged relationships, both for fur trading and because he hoped to gently convert them to Christianity. He said he took delight in conversations that he had with a nearby Sagamore, even though the time had not yet come when that man would convert. So they would simply have to pray for him and wait for God's timing. But Thomas Gorges had walked into a situation which was much rougher than he understood. First, he recruited a preacher, who he was really excited about, named George Burdett, only to find out that Burdett was a free love advocate whose womanizing went past womanizing to, well, in the words of a contemporary, the often soliciting of women to his incontinent practices and persuading them by scriptures to satisfy his insatiable lust. And these women included multiple married women. Astonished, Thomas fined him enough that he had to return to England, and from there, Burdett went to Ireland and became a successful preacher. But it wasn't just scandal. There were genuine conflicts within Maine, and instead of walking into the colony as an authority figure who demanded respect, Thomas had come as an idealist who planned to implement democratic practices and accept colonist input into the running of the colony. And there was a consistent, persistent issue of land disputes, which would have been trying for anyone to deal with, and which required a certain level of authority 
There were people wanting to dishonestly manipulate land boundaries, and there were plots of land which had genuinely been sold twice, because they were being sold by people in England who had never stepped foot in America. And all of these issues were made worse by the extreme political divisions, and with all of this combined, people weren't prepared to just unite for a common cause behind a good person. So there were two traders slash entrepreneurs who both claimed the same island, Richmond's Island. One man named Robert Trelawney had bought it a couple years before a man named George Cleave. The two had been competing over the land for years, and now it was Thomas Gorges' job to figure out what to do. There was no functioning court system in Maine, so Thomas got together a jury, and the jury ruled in favor of Cleve. But so what? The issue had been going on since long before Thomas Gorges had arrived, and Trelawney's position was that there was no real reason to listen to the young governor. If he was in the right, who cared if some kid from England said otherwise? And besides, Trelawney was friends with Ferdinando Gorges, so he just went to the actual proprietor of the colony to state his case and added the accusation that Thomas and Cleves were traitors. I would imagine that this was a reference more than anything to the support that both had for Parliament, but Thomas took the accusation extremely personally. And when Ferdinando sided with Trelawney, it just illustrated that Thomas had no real power or authority in Maine while allowing a pretty harsh accusation to stand. And then when Cleve wanted to appeal, he of course ignored the young governor and sailed straight for England. And when he did... Ferdinando didn't give him the island, but he did give him a massive grant of land and hired him to keep an eye on the Massachusetts Bay Colony and oppose it if necessary. And then, Gorges also hired Thomas Morton of Marymount fame for the same purpose. And Cleve and Morton immediately ganged up on Thomas and refused to involve him in the colony's affairs at all. Thomas wasn't even sure which of his letters was reaching England and which were being intercepted by Cleve and Morton. So all it took was one legal case for Thomas's governorship to go spiraling out of control. And once you lose control like that, it's very difficult to get it back. He was isolated, alone, powerless, and personally upset by the things that had happened, so he threw up his hands, left a man named Edward Godfrey in charge, and returned to England. He joined the Parliamentary Army, made his name as an officer there, and never returned to America. I mean, how many stories like this have we heard at this point? The plight of these early governors is something that I thought a lot about as a teacher, because you start to realize that a small mistake or seemingly innocuous series of events can lead to a real struggle to keep control, and that's on a small scale. And then you realize just how hard it is to regain control after you've lost it. And all these people coming in with no experience, having to forge order out of chaos that already existed in a time and place when life, death, and destitution were all on the line, was almost an impossible task. Doing it without being a Thomas Dale or John Endicott-style tyrant, for lack of a better word, was doubly hard. And I've been really hard on the Dales and Endicotts of our story, but the fact is that their colonies did survive under them. So I don't know. It was a very rough time, and a very difficult job, and well, Thomas Gorges was just one of many failed governors in an all-too-empathizable way. The other thing that's important about this little story is that it explains how Morton and Cleve ended up being hired by Ferdinando Gorges and getting the power that they did in Maine. And when they got that power, they utterly turned against him. I mean, they of course did whatever they could to oppose Massachusetts too, including prompting the king to try to take the charter, 
But they weren't loyal to Gorges either. Ferdinando, that is. Nor, for that matter, were they loyal to Laud or the king, as at least Cleve was a dedicated parliamentarian. More than anything, though, the two were profit-minded businessmen who would make the alliances they needed to to get what they wanted. Together, Morton and Cleve found an old, defunct patent called the Ligonia Patent, named in honor of Gorges' own mother, which had been issued to a group of London investors in 1630. Those investors had sent about ten families of familists, and once that settlement quickly collapsed, they had abandoned the whole idea. I think I might have mentioned it in the past, but apart from, and honestly including, its religious radicalism, Ligonia was nothing that we haven't talked about, just a handful of people going to the new world and either dying or leaving. Getting a patent was easy, but creating a functional settlement was something else entirely. People getting and abandoning patents was pretty common throughout the new world, but it was really common in Maine, and no one thought anything of it. And if Morton and Cleve hadn't come along, Ligonia would simply have been added to the long, long list of patents which are not only forgotten today, but which were totally inconsequential at the time. But Morton and Cleve did come along, and they found out about this Ligonia patent, and they found out that the patent covered all the most profitable, important land in the region for fishing and trading, as well as the majority of Maine's coastline, as well as most of its towns, and therefore the majority of its population. So, in 1642, Cleve went back to England, ostensibly to voice complaints about his issues on Richmond's Island, but really to angle for control of Ligonia. When he got there, he first went to Parliament and talked about his complaints in a very general way, using political language, and finishing with the notion that there was nothing they could really do about the issue yet, but he hoped that they would be open to any solutions which happened to unexpectedly present themselves in the future. Then he connected with one of the original patentees, a meeting that Thomas Morton probably set up, to talk about reviving the claim. The man, named Alexander Rigby, was predictably a parliamentarian, and Cleve's proposal was simply that he revive the claim and leave Cleve to do his thing, while Rigby focused on the English politics that he was already engrossed in. Cleve just needed the name on the paper, and he would take care of the rest. And Rigby agreed. It was a win-win. Cleve would get control of all the best parts of Maine, and Rigby would get a chance to chip away at the royalist Gorges' money and influence, as well as standing a chance of personal profit, without actually doing anything. Legally, this was totally preposterous in every way, especially because an abandoned patent was legally a defunct one. But politically, Gorges was a royalist while Cleve was a parliamentarian, and Gorges was already getting some flack for being too feudalistic in Maine. Much the same political complaints as plagued Baltimore, while Cleve was suggesting that he would build a much more democratic society than Gorges intended to. And Parliament agreed to the idea, naturally, but without involving the king. Proof of patent and his own authority in hand, Cleve returned to New England. He traveled around Ligonia, informing its inhabitants that they were now living under a new government, and encouraging them to get involved in that government. Maine's new governor, Richard Vines, confronted him, but there were no courts to settle the issue, really. Maine didn't have courts yet, and England was by now at war. Gorges and Rigby were fighting on opposite sides of this war, and Maine was no one's priority, so there was no real way to settle the issue. Besides, Parliament had and would continue to side with Rigby, whereas the king would side with Gorges, and that could only be opposed if it lost the war, 
So the outcome of the war would settle the issue of the Ligonia patent as well, and the only question was how to treat the contested land while the war played out. And for this temporary verdict, Vine and Cleve agreed to go to Massachusetts to ask its general court to appoint a jury to decide what should happen until a final ruling came from England. Vine could hope that Cleve's belligerent actions against the Bay Colony would sway its decision in his favor, while Cleve relied heavily on his Puritanism, parliamentarian sympathy, and association with Rigby to bolster his cause. Gorges was also not liked in Massachusetts, and Cleve spread rumors to further discredit him, even going so far as to say that he died trying to flee to Wales. Massachusetts refused to get involved, and justifiably so, but this request alerted them to the divisions in the area, and Maine's inability to handle them on its own. By 1645, Parliament was the clear victor in the war, and a burned-out Vines saw the writing on the wall. He left Maine and settled in the increasingly royalist Barbados. The writing on the wall was correct, and next year, Warwick's Committee for Plantations, which included Cromwell, confirmed Rigby's ownership of Ligonia, and therefore Cleve's authority there. The irony of the situation, though, was that the very democratic parliamentarian principles which Cleve had advocated in order to get his power from England now started his downfall in Ligonia. And that's because the colonists in Maine tended to be royalist. In no way were they as uniformly royalist as those in Virginia or even Newfoundland. But if they were living in Maine, it's because they didn't want to live in the United Colonies. Life in Maine was poorer by far, and not too far away, so the only real appeal of living in Maine was being free of the rigid Puritan structure of the majority of New England society. Some Maine colonists were absolutely Puritans who had been pushed out of Massachusetts for relatively minor theological disputes, like Anne Hutchinson ally John Wheelwright, but mostly they were royalists who wanted to live in New England without the whole Puritan thing. So when it came time to vote for who would lead the colony, Cleve was not chosen. In fact, the men who were chosen were Cleve's former rivals, Robert Jordan from the Richmond Island dispute, and Gorge's ally Henry Jocelyn took the most important positions while Cleve served under and outnumbered by them. Cleve went to England, complained to Rigby, and returned with a demand that Maine's elected leaders do nothing more without Rigby's permission. In other words, he returned with a revocation of the very democratic government that he had been advocating. But Lycoonians were thoroughly unimpressed, and realizing that Rigby couldn't actually do anything from England, especially while the war was going on, simply ignored their new proprietor and his deputy president. After all of that, Cleve found himself in the exact same position as the people from whom he had taken control of Ligonia, and Ligonia residents found that the change in ownership didn't actually change anything about their existence. They were still impoverished, still had no real government institutions, still had no structures to promote overarching economic growth, and even the ones who cared about having democratic institutions still found themselves without them. Cleve rival John Winter said that he didn't know how Ligonians could even buy clothes at this point with the level of their poverty. They went two months without buying bread and had already killed enough of their animals that they would soon be facing meat shortages. So, that was the state of Maine, or what remained of Maine, along with Ligonia, when Ferdinando Gorges died in 1647. 81 years old, penniless, and under house arrest for his support of the Royalists, 
he had spent his last days writing about the beauty of a new world that he had never seen. It had consumed him, and along with the Earl of Warwick, he'd probably done more than any other individual to bring about English colonization in North America. But never in a way that profited him. A couple years later, King Charles was also dead, and Cromwell's Commonwealth took his place. And six months after that, Rigby died too, removing the same leadership from Ligonia as Gorges's death had eliminated in Maine. The whole region was suddenly very unprotected. And that is what brings us to Massachusetts. In 1649, it was a new world. Gorges was gone, Puritans were in control, and royal charters were all but invalid at this point. Maine was high-quality land with abundant natural resources, including valuable furs, but it was clumsily run and struggling. And by taking it, Massachusetts would solidify itself as the dominant power north of Virginia, as well as creating a buffer between itself and French Acadia. It would also establish Puritanism in what was supposed to be a rival Anglican colony, And if things went well, they might also be able to take the main lands which Charles I had allowed the French to claim, meaning Acadia. And Massachusetts had already begun its expansion, especially in New Hampshire after Mason had died, an area within Maine where lots of disaffected Massachusetts citizens like John Wheelwright and other Hutchinson supporters had relocated. And as Massachusetts planned the takeover, Maine and Ligonia leadership worked to figure things out themselves. They knew that their future was very much in jeopardy, and when they contacted Parliament, they worryingly got no reply. I mean, Parliament had more important things to do, but still, it was worrying. So, Edward Godfrey took charge. Once a London merchant, he had been a leader in the Maine region since the 1620s, before Massachusetts was even founded, and worked with pretty much everyone to help get colonization up and running there. So now, he called an assembly with everyone from New Hampshire to Ligonia, and proposed that they work together, at least for the time being. Not a complete union of the settlements, so there would be no talk of the rivalry between Maine and Ligonia, but a social compact for self-protection. A centralized government for everyone in the region which could advocate for a united group of colonies better than each colony could advocate for itself. Then, hopefully, England would allow them to continue existing as before, The settlements agreed, and Godfrey was their logical leader. People he'd been working with to lead Maine were elected to help him lead the Combination, as it was called. They would act under the original royal charters and try to get those confirmed. Cleve was the exception and didn't unite with the others. He still wanted to focus on his parliamentary support rather than ally with Godfrey And in fact, he saw the new situation as an opportunity to possibly extend his control over the largely royalist Maine. But royalists in Ligonia who hadn't liked Rigby or Cleve and who had continued to support Gorges were now working to support Godfrey's plan. So there was a split there and Cleve went to England to try to secure his patent both from the Ligonia opposition and from Massachusetts. He would contact Rigby's heir and also set forward his case before the rump and hopefully preserve and even extend his fabulous claim. The issue, though, is that Ligonia's inability to unite, even within its own borders, strengthened Massachusetts' arguments that the region needed more oversight. And Massachusetts had both agents in England to continually advocate for its interests, as well as a close relationship with Cromwell. 
Ligonia's patent was treated no differently from Maine's, and both were left vulnerable, perhaps even more so than before Cleve's visit. And by the time he returned to New England in 1653, Cleve's position would be even weaker. Massachusetts had, in this time, redefined its northern borders and sent surveyors to stake out the new lines. This redefinition had already swallowed New Hampshire, and it took large chunks from Maine and Ligonia as well. When Joseph Mason, relative of New Hampshire's John, came to New England at around this time, he found his colony completely taken over with no way to reverse the change. He complained to the general court, but the court simply explained that it had always owned the land and that its current interpretation of its borders had always been the interpretation. This was absolutely untrue, with plenty of documents showing Massachusetts's recognition of the old borders, but there was nothing that Mason could do. The general court would, of course, rule in its own favor, and England wasn't likely to overturn this. And while these surveyors were there, they visited every town in Maine and Ligonia and talked about just how smoothly things ran in the United Colonies, and just how prosperous everyone was there. And while these surveyors were in Maine and Ligonia, they visited every town in the region and talked about just how smoothly things ran in the United Colonies, and just how prosperous everyone was there. And they suggested that Maine and Ligonia settlers might possibly be better off if they joined with the Bay Colony. When Cleve heard about this activity, he protested, but he got the same answer as Mason had. The boundaries that Massachusetts was now asserting had always been the borders, and our surveyors are doing nothing more than just talking to people, offering help to make things better. And what was Cleve going to do? He hadn't gotten protection from England, and there was no one else to arbitrate the case. So he finally joined forces with Godfrey, Mason, and Ferdinando's son and heir, John Gorges, but it was too late. Massachusetts's takeover had begun, and at this point, the Bay Colony had to do nothing more then hold firm. The Bay Colony continued to stand by its new interpretation, and Godfrey organized Maine's Provincial General Court. There, they continued their protests against the Massachusetts Court and drew up a petition to Parliament, asking for their patent to be confirmed and declaring their allegiance to the Commonwealth government. Godfrey emphasized just how much money that they had invested in Maine and how their authority had been approved and justified in England and said, therefore, that all the colonies of Maine would not submit unless the Commonwealth ordered it. With Godfrey and Cleve united in petitioning Cromwell's government, Massachusetts decided to get a vote from each town that it intended to take over. A vote in favor of takeover, though wholly illegal, would give the illusion of legitimacy and all but seal their case within England, should it come to that. They would easily be able to dismiss opposition as nothing but a few royalist officers not wanting to give up power. So, a group of Massachusetts commissioners started a new journey, and over the course of a few weeks, they visited each settlement in New Hampshire, Maine, and Ligonia. And in each town, after a furious debate, residents voted to submit. Massachusetts commissioners had come with a plan to push hard for this outcome, and ultimately, even the most diehard opponents of submission were forced to sign their recognition of the Massachusetts government. Commissioners would not negotiate at all and would only reveal the concessions that they had already decided to make after the colonists voted. They started by appealing to the poorest of colonists 
and work their way on up. Leaders who voted for submission would be able to keep some level of public office, but if they opposed submission, they would have to withdraw from colony affairs entirely. And Massachusetts was both stronger and better connected in England, so the choice seemed to be between submission with concessions and takeover without them. And one by one, the towns fell. Kittery was the first town visited, and there, one man started to make violent enough threats toward the Massachusetts commissioners that he was brought before a makeshift trial even during the debates. After confessing his misbehavior, Massachusetts commissioners released him, and after four days of debate, Kittery residents agreed to submit. When that submission happened, Kittery was informed that the region it was in would be renamed Yorkshire, and that it would be entitled to a deputy on the general court and two if it wanted. A group of three people was appointed to operate as a provincial court, and Massachusetts said it wouldn't draft people from the town for anything without their consent. After Kittery was Godfrey's own town, and Gorgias' proposed capital, Gorgiana, and there Godfrey continued to fight. Using the same tactics, though, Massachusetts commissioners overcame his opposition, and the vote favored takeover. Then, they offered him the chance to continue in office if he joined in the vote to submit. The vote was already cast, and this was the only way for Godfrey to maintain even a little bit of influence, so he reluctantly added his name to the bottom of the list. He was appointed one of three members of the town's court, and that town was renamed too. With each town to submit, the next debate became a little shorter and easier. Cleve couldn't resist either, and was now demoted to the position of small claims judge. He went from being the owner of the nicest land in New England, to being able to hear court cases of up to 50 pounds within a jurisdiction of two towns, and that would be his job for the rest of his life. After all this was done, Cromwell quickly confirmed Massachusetts' new borders. And with that victory, they continued to spread. The handful of small settlements which had existed beyond its originally proposed boundaries were now incorporated, and Massachusetts turned its eye toward Plymouth-owned land on the Kennebec, as well as to French Acadia. With Dalnay dead, and Latour totally apathetic about which country owned the province as long as he kept his own estate, as well as Cromwell's support for the English retaking of French Acadia, that was easy. So, by July 5th, 1653, Massachusetts had officially extended its boundaries throughout English Maine, and by 1654 it had French Acadia. And, by 1658, it had taken the Kennebec land, too. This made the bay not only the most populous, but the largest and most resource-rich colony north of Virginia, whether owned by England or any other country. It had no equals in power or affluence. And this would continue to be the case for over a century. Massachusetts settlers would expand to the more remote sub-colony of Maine, including a group of Scottish POWs trying to escape the social confines of the Bay Colony. And as this migration happened, Maine would shift from being a fundamentally Anglican colony to being one that looked increasingly like Massachusetts in economy, religion, and education. Dissenters absolutely continued to exist, and they continued to oppose and protest Massachusetts' claim to Maine. But they lost prominence and influence, and never successfully advocated for Maine to return to its original ownership situation. In fact, more than anything, Maine would be a region of second-class citizens and would remain that way for as long as it was owned by Massachusetts. Cleve continued to try to protest, and he continued to fail, and Godfrey left for England in 1655, 
to repent of his previous weakness and argue against the unjustness of Massachusetts' takeover. But not only was he unsuccessful at this, his life was destroyed in the process of trying. All the turmoil had put him a thousand pounds in debt and unable to recover the costs while in England. He died in 1663 in a debtor's prison at 80 years old and was buried in an unknown grave. A lot of people have argued that, practically speaking, the main takeover by Massachusetts was for the best because it started to lessen the poverty and infighting which plagued the region. At the same time, though, it was undeniably one of the sleazier moments in Bay Colony history, and it would have some implications which we'll explore later. But we'll have to leave that for another day and simply recognize that, for now, one of our colonies has disappeared from the map and another has grown significantly more powerful. Next episode we are going to have what's perhaps our most remarkably perfectly timed episode ever because it's time to talk about witches. <laughs>